Today as we begin our Christmas series called The Season of Wonders, I'd like to read something from C.S. Lewis's book called Miracles. He wrote, everywhere the great enters the little. Its power to do so is almost the test of its greatness. In the Christian story, God comes down. Down from the heights of absolute being into time and space. Down into humanity. Down further still. If embryologists are right to recapitulate in the womb ancient and pre-human phases of life. Down to the very roots and seabed of the nature he has created. But he goes down to come up again and bring the whole ruin, ruined world up with him. One may think of a diver first reducing himself to nakedness, then glancing in midair, then gone with a splash, vanished, rushing down through green and warm water into black and cold water, down through increasing pressure into the death-like region of ooze and slime and old decay. Then up again, back to color and light, his lungs almost bursting, till suddenly he breaks surface again, holding in his hand the dripping, precious thing that he went down to recover. That would be you, by the way. You are the precious, dripping thing that he went down to recover. Open your Bible today to Isaiah chapter 9. As you're opening, I'd like to read a poem to you called Praise Him in My Heart by Joseph Bailey. He wrote, Praise God for Christmas. Praise Him for the incarnation, for the Word made flesh. I will not sing of shepherds watching flocks on frosty nights or angel choristers. I will not sing of a stable bear in Bethlehem or lowing oxen, wise men trailing star with gold, frankincense and myrrh. Tonight, I will sing praise to the Father who stood on heaven's threshold and said farewell to his son as he stepped across the stars to Bethlehem and Jerusalem. And I will sing praise to the infinite eternal son who became most finite a baby who would one day be executed for my crime. Praise him in the heavens. Praise him in the stable. Praise him in my heart. You see, to understand Christmas is to understand the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. The Amplified Bible calls it the good, glad, merry news that makes you want to leap for joy. So let's read from Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to read verse 2, and I'm going to skip down and read verses 5 and 6, where the Bible says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death upon them... A light has shined. For every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You encounter darkness every day. While, while you may experience, you know, Instagram-worthy sunny day picnic lunches complete with rainbows and lollipops and butterflies, the reality is that life is a lot more like a midnight walk through the woods. On any given day, you probably encounter more darkness than you do truth. Paul the Apostle wrote that we wrestle against rulers of spiritual darkness. So to move forward through the darkness and to get to where you're meant to go, you need something to light your way. And the good news is, God has given us light. The first words recorded by God in the Bible are, let there be light. Into darkness, into emptiness, into void, into chaos, he said, let there be light. Light is a symbol of hope. And Bible hope is never just optimism. It's always a confident expectation of good. In John's gospel, we're told in John chapter 1, in him, in Christ, was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. 
New Living Translation puts verse 5 like this. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. How many of you know darkness never puts out light? Darkness is simply the absence of light. And that's why the tiniest flame dispels darkness. It's actually been said only limited by the curvature of the earth. But if someone on a deep, dark, moonless light in the middle of the sea were to light a match, that little match head lit could be seen 16 miles away. You see, light is best seen in darkness. Where there's darkness is where light is needed most. And if light is hope and darkness is hopelessness, then hope is needed where there is hopelessness. Christmas. The incarnation is the supreme expression of our God bringing hope to the hopeless. And the next time you feel hopeless... When darkness seems to be closing in on you and the future looks bleak and you feel like you're all out of options, maybe it's your financial situation, maybe you've experienced loss or pain, maybe someone has betrayed you or you're just frustrated and exhausted and spent. Listen, when your world goes dark, empty, chaotic, or void of meaning and purpose, when your situation seems hopeless, ready? Think about Christmas. Think about Christmas. Call to mind the incarnation. Because on that starry night in the little town of Bethlehem, on the night that Jesus was born, the world was hopeless. The world was a mess. The world was in darkness. What kind of darkness? The word in Hebrew is chosek. And it means misery, destruction, death, ignorance, obscurity, sorrow, and wickedness. The world had some serious darkness to it. It was into a dark, tumultuous, war-torn, impoverished, politically tense, and complex time in history that Jesus was born. The world at that time was in turmoil and discord. Wars and rumors of wars abounded. Isaiah said the people walked in darkness. That they dwelt in darkness. But when Matthew quotes Isaiah from this same passage, Matthew says they sat in darkness. Like they didn't sit with it, they sat in it. You see, my family, you can sit with your problems, and you should. You can sit with your troubles, you can sit with your grief, you can sit with those issues in faith and in wisdom and process your way through it. Or or you can sit in your trouble and sulk and lick your wounds and do nothing but watch your wounds fester. They sat in darkness. It was their posture. They chose darkness. They were content with darkness. They were okay with it. They loved it. They stayed in it. They sat in it. And some things never change. Our world today is not too much different than the world in which Jesus came into. Then as now, life seems to have a lot of dark corners gathering clouds and shadows. And our society, well, our society has become Michelin star chefs at making word salad. We live in a world where people come up with creative ways to call light darkness, and, to, and, and darkness is celebrated as light. And by the way, no one knows how to fix it. I said no one knows how to fix it. The billionaire class bloviates that they do, but they don't. No one really knows how to cure suffering and evil that we find in our world today. And and by the way, wickedness isn't something that you throw money at to fix it. Matter of fact, quite the opposite. If you throw more money at wickedness, usually it becomes more wicked. Before the announcement of light in Isaiah 9... The backstory, the background, the context is actually the end of Isaiah 8. And it says in the end of Isaiah 8 that the people of God were consulting wizards and mediums and familiar spirits. 
The previous chapter, Isaiah 8, ends with this, verses 21 and 22. I have it in the New Revised Standard. It says, they will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry. They will look to the earth, but they will see only distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. Did you see that? They look to the earth. They look to the earth. They're looking to earthbound resources, human solutions to fix the world. And it only gets them further into thicker darkness, further gloom and anguish and distress. Solomon, in all of his wisdom, he said, listen, I looked to the earth. I looked at everything under the sun, and it's all empty. It's all futile. It's all vanity. They will look to the earth, but they will see only distress and darkness. They, they, they were looking to their experts and mystics and scholars for solutions. What they were saying is, yes, yes, we, we, we are in darkness, but we can fix it ourselves. We can overcome darkness on our own. People make the exact same claim today. Some people look to the government and politics. God help them. Right? Right? Some look to business and the marketplace. Some look to technology and metaphysics. The same thing they said then is what the world says now. Yes, the world we live in can be a dark place, but we can overcome all the darkness with our intellect and our advancement and our innovation. We can put an end to poverty and injustice and violence and evil. We can make our own utopia. If we just all pull together, we can create peace on earth and good will towards men. Can I ask you a question like, how's that working out? Like, how's that? Can, 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 somebody, can somebody give me a report card on how humanity is doing getting rid of all the evil in the world? See, the problem is that peace on earth and goodwill toward men, it wasn't an insert, uh, assertion. It wasn't in instruction. It wasn't good advice for people to do. It was the good news. It was an angelic announcement of what God had already done in sending his son. We look to the earth, human advancement and achievement, secular solutions, the darkness only gets worse. The message of Christianity is not that we can manufacture a new world, not that we can fix the world ourselves. The message of Christianity is this, the world is a dark place and we cannot fix it. We can't heal ourselves, we can't save ourselves, but there is hope. A hope that is not from this earth. Not from human ingenuity. This hope did not come from under the sun. This is a hope that came down from heaven. A hope that came down upon the earth. A hope that was announced by angels. Stopped shepherds in their tracks. And was witnessed by wise men. The people who walked in darkness. Have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death. Upon them a light has shined. Notice the light has not sprung up from them. It has not come from, from within. It has come upon. Upon the world a light has shined. And it's not the light of a matchstick. It's not the light of a candle. It's not even the light of a fireplace. Nor is it the light of religion. It's not the light of the Old Testament law. No, it was a great light, a vast light, an illuminating light, a light of grace, a light of mercy, a light that reveals, a comforting light, a guiding light, a growing light, a light that's far greater than the sun and all the stars combined. However, the people did not seek after that light. They weren't looking for the light. They weren't calling for light. They weren't even groping for light. John chapter 1 says they rejected the light. Because fallen human nature preferred the darkness over the light then and still does 2,000 years later. But because God is good, because God is love, as always, the Lord proactively took the initiative, and guess what? He shined light on them anyway. Hey, listen, I wasn't looking for God. I said, I wasn't looking for God. 
When I was 20 years old, when I was a drug addict and a dealer, I wasn't out there looking for God. I wasn't, I wasn't searching for truth. I wasn't seeking God. But guess what? God was seeking me. God was after me. I mean, like you think about it, Adam and Eve, they weren't looking for God after they fell. No, they were hiding from God. But the Lord was looking for them. Listen, it's called prevenient grace. When God seeks you out long before you ever seek him. A light has come from outside of this world. A light from another world, a light from above. And that light is none other than the person of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 8, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. He is saying that those who follow him will not walk in misery. They won't walk in ignorance. They won't walk in sorrow. And they won't walk in wickedness. Darkness won't deceive them. They won't be led astray. They'll never be hopeless. He said, I will not leave them comfortless. And they will, have, they, they will not have, they, they will not place their hope in sources that don't have the power to deliver because those who follow the Lord are those upon which his light has shined. Back to Isaiah's prophecy, what we translate as a light has shined is probably better translated, uh, the light has brilliantly flashed. So how does this God light, how does it shine or brilliantly flash upon us? Verse 6 tells us how. I want us to read it together this morning in a nice, loud voice. Ready? Let's read. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The light that brilliantly flashes forth, it happens because the child, the child is wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. It is incredibly noteworthy that these four titles are applied to a newborn child. This baby who will be born in a manger, in a feeding trough, because there's no room for his parents at the inn. Now, now listen, listen, listen. i got to stop for a second. I know you've heard this story a thousand times. You may have even been somebody who's read it in your Bible a hundred times. But I cannot possibly encourage you enough to always approach the Scripture with fresh eyes. And hear it with fresh ears. To always approach the text as if you've never heard it before or never read it before. And that's how you will always discover new things in old stories. Listen, that's what I do. That's what I've been trying to do now. And I'm coming on 40 years of studying this sacred book. And if I do it with fresh ears and fresh eyes like I've never seen it before or never heard it before. Guess what? By the grace of God, I'm always finding new treasure. These four titles are applied to the infant wrapped in swaddling clothes so he won't scratch himself with his little baby fingernails. That should blow our minds. These four titles applied to the child, they're, they're titles for God. The baby born on, in Bethlehem that night, witnessed by more animals than humans, is that baby, he's mighty God. He's everlasting father. He's creator, sustainer of the universe. He's the one who breathes life into dust and makes it into living souls. That baby born in Bethlehem is the self-existent one. He is the one who is and was and is to come. That infant is the uncaused cause of all things. He's unlimited in power. He's undiminished in wisdom. He's unsullied in holiness. He's undefeated in battle. He's unrivaled in might. He's invariable in veracity. Mary, did you know that the little child you're holding is the great I Am? 
Like it's almost too limiting to say that we celebrate Christmas. We should be dumbfounded by Christmas. We should be flabbergasted, flummoxed, jolted, stunned, and stupefied, astonished, and astounded by Christmas. We, we are to be bewildered in wonder and worship. We are to be lost in his love. We shouldn't be able to restrain ourselves from singing, oh, come, let us adore him. Just like the shepherds saw a great light. And the wise men were led by a great light. Not just a light, but the all caps, bold, underlined, and highlighted light of lights has brilliantly flashed on our darkness. God is being born into our world. Let's look at two applications today. First, if the babe born in a manger really is mighty God and everlasting Father, you can't just like him. I've said it before, but it bears repeating. Jesus can't just be an add-on to your life. He's not an addendum. He's not a component. He's not your co-pilot. He's not your life coach. He's not the one who's helping you realize your goals and dreams. You can't compartmentalize him. You can't push him to the margins. He's not just a historical figure. He's not just an ancient religious icon. He's not just jewelry to hang around your neck or a tat to put on your arm. He's not just an inspiration. He's not even just an example. No one who actually met him reacted that way. No one acted indifferently. No one responded to him casually. They were either scared of him, furious at him, or they knelt before him and they worshipped him. No one responded mildly. No one just liked him. Nobody said, you know, he's so motivational. He makes me want to live a better life. Nobody said that. If the baby born in Bethlehem is mighty God, then you are compelled to forsake all and follow him, serve him, fall on your knees, fall on your face, push all your chips to the center of the table, and be all in, sold out. Secondly, when you're going through something, something that's very difficult or, or very trying or very painful, um, it, it, it's good to talk to someone who's been through the same thing. A counselor who's walked the same path, who's been there, who can really relate to your situation. If God has actually subjected himself to being born of a woman, if the word really became flesh and dwelt among us, if Jesus of Nazareth is really Christ the Messiah, if he was in all points tempted as we, yet without sin, then you have something that is remarkably unique. No other religion claims this. Ready? You have a God that gets you. He gets you. You have a God who really understands you. Like he gets you, not just externally, not just from observing you, but from inside your experience. You have a God who suffered, who had to be courageous, who knows what it's like to be abandoned by his friends, who weeps, who's moved by injustice, and he's a counselor. He will give you counsel when you feel like you're being crushed. His word is remarkably therapeutic. His wisdom is yours for the asking. How many of you know he'll guide you? He'll speak peace to you. He'll give you real-time solutions for your problems and your dilemmas that you're facing. He'll lead you through the woods at midnight into green pastures and beside still and restful waters. He'll restore your soul in the warmth and the comfort of his light. And Jesus can do that because he's been there. If you've been betrayed, he's been there. If you've been treated unfairly, he's been there. 
If you've been called names and lied about, talked about behind your back, listen, if no one understands you, no one seems to get you, Jesus does. He was massively misunderstood, still is today. Those closest to him were often clueless. He was abandoned, he was belittled, he was betrayed, and radically taken advantage of. Listen, he's walked a million miles in your moccasins. He gets you. Wonderful, counselor, mighty, God, everlasting father, prince of peace, gets you. He, 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 he's the ultimate counselor. And yet Isaiah called him wonderful counselor. Wonderful counselor. Now the word wonderful is the word pele in Hebrew. And it means extraordinary, marvelous, miraculous, beyond the bounds of human powers or expectations. But it also means. Beautiful. Beautiful. Jesus is beautiful. Jesus is beautiful because he left the perfection of heaven. The perfection of the triune Godhead. The perichoresis, the dance of the Trinity where God the Son had need of nothing. And yet he still wanted us. He still desired us. Like one day in that dance of the Trinity, the Father, God, the, the, the Father turns to God the Son and God the Son says to God the Father, Father, I want them. I desire them. I will leave this and go there. I want them. See, he Jesus was determined to save you. He was resolved to rescue you. He chose to redeem you. He desired to bless you. And he intentionally sought you out. You did not choose him. He chose you. He treasured you like that. He gave up everything for you. He condescended. Divine condescension. Like only God would ever even think of that. In every respect, infinite, unspeakable, unfathomable condescension. God became enmeshed in our condition. He plunged himself willingly, voluntarily into your darkness all because he loved you. And that, my family, that's beautiful. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. But made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. He did it voluntarily, willingly, of his own volition, of his own initiative, of his own accord, without reservation, out of sheer love. That is beauty personified. Jesus Christ is the beauty that replaces our spiritual weakness with strength, our spiritual darkness with light. He is the one that replaces our spiritual deadness with life. He is the beauty that heals our spiritual blindness with sight. He is the beauty that displaces all other desires and puts them all in their proper place. He is the power beyond human power that breaks our chains, that breaks our addictions. He is the wonderful counselor who knows us better than we know ourselves, who knows every word that we speak before we speak it. He knows every thought that we think before we think it, and he loves us still. He walks with us into, through, and to the other side of darkness. And if you're going through a dark time right now, if you're dealing with great sadness, if you've been disappointed, neglected, taken advantage of, if you've been trying to cope with depression and despair, know that the Lord is with you in it. He will, he, listen to me, he will get you through it. I know sometimes it doesn't feel like it, but listen to me today. He will get you through it. He will get you to the other side of it. There is an other side of it, and he'll get you to it. Why? Because he gets you. He knows you. And he loves you with an everlasting, unshakable, unchangeable love. 
Jesus is the wonderful counselor who walks with you through the night. And he is the light when all other lights go out. David sung it like this. David said, in your light we see light. In his light we see real hope. In his light, we see confident expectation. In his light, we see lasting solutions. In his light, we see healing for our brokenness. In his light, we see wholeness and holiness. Confidence and courage. Comfort and compassion. Every other light. Every light supposedly shining from human machinations, human intellect, human innovation. Listen, they are all dim reflections and refractions in comparison to his marvelous light. And so when we see his beauty, when we see him as the ultimate beauty, the desire above all other desires, when we behold the beauty of the Lord, like it changes us. It changes us. Like sometimes you can tell. Like you can tell if somebody has experienced Jesus like that. There's something about somebody who beholds the beauty of the Lord, there's a beauty that's reflected in them. Like you know that person knows the Lord. You know that they've beheld his beauty. There's just something about it. Why? Because when you do, it changes everything. See, then following Jesus is no longer a duty. Following Jesus is no longer an obligation. See, now you worship because he's beautiful to you. Now you serve because, like, I can't imagine not. Now you give and you forgive and follow because you're in awe. The person of Jesus, like, takes your breath away. Who he is and what he laid down. Let me say that again. Who he is and what he laid down. What he laid down and sacrificed for you. Man, when you you get it. It melts you. It melts your heart. It captivates you. The Bible says the love of God compels us. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The shepherds watching their flocks at night. This is what they're told. It says they're told by the angels. For there is born to you. To you. There is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Listen to me. The creator of the universe entered his own creation unto us. Mighty God submitted to the human birthing process. He grew in Mary's womb. He became an embryo, a fetus unto us. God. Nursed at his mother's breast unto us. God had his diaper changed unto us. God cried when his teeth cut through his gums unto us. God learned how to walk and talk unto us. Like I don't know, for whatever reason, I always think about how one day toddler God would giggle when he got his feet wet with the dew on the grass at Mary and Joseph's house in in, in Nazareth. Only thing is, ready, he created the dew, he created the grass. He came from heaven to earth. He condescended beyond our ability to comprehend condescension. And he did it all unto us, unto you. And if God did not spare his only begotten son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him give us freely all things? As we conclude, watch this. Back to our target text in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 5. Verse 5 almost seems out of place. One that you'd never print on a Christmas card. But if we couple it with verse 6, which is the verse you always find on a Christmas card. Let's read it there. Verses 5 and 6 says this. For every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. 
For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So verse 5, warriors, sandals, noisy battles, bloodied garments. And then he says, take all those things and throw them in the fire. Not necessary. None of those things in verse 5 are necessary because of verse 6. Because of who's coming. And the imagery means this. The greatest victory of all will not require you to fight. Are you hearing me? The greatest victory of all will not require you to fight. You won't need a warrior's boot. You won't need to get bloodied in battle. No need for earthly armor or a sword. Melt them down. Burn them up. The battle belongs to the Lord. Your fight will be fought by another. Your victory will be won by another. It will be paid in full and gifted to you by grace. You will not earn it. You will not deserve it. You will not achieve it. You will not have to fight for it. You only need to believe and receive it. This great salvation, this total forgiveness, your deliverance from addiction, your justification, your sanctification, your righteousness, your emotional well-being, your mental health, your healing and wholeness, this light, this hope that flashes into your life with new beginnings and fresh starts, with reconciliation and restoration, it comes as a gift unto us a son is given. It's sheer grace. See, the Lord Jesus himself fought that battle and won that victory. And my family, it is a victory over every enemy. I got to say, it's a victory over every enemy. God left no stone unturned. It's a victory over every enemy. No exceptions, no exclusions. It's a victory over every enemy. Everything that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Everything that comes to discourage and dishearten and darken. Jesus won that victory on the cross at Calvary unto us. Receive it today. Receive it today. By faith, take that victory. Believe, trust, fully rely upon his victory. The victory over your battle with bad habits. The victory over the, your battle with habitual sin. The victory over your battle with low self-worth, low self-esteem, even self-loathing. The victory over your battle with sickness and disease, your emotional battle, your financial battle. The battle for your peace and your joy, your fight against fatigue and stress and exhaustion. Your fight just to be somebody. Listen, today you can stop the wrestling and you can start resting because the battle belongs to the Lord. And Jesus has won the victory. Yeah. 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 Oh, what are you struggling with? What kind of darkness has come on you? You need to look that thing square in the eye. You need to get right up in that thing's grill and say, Jesus has already beat you. You've already been knocked down, knocked out, so just stay down and get out of my way. Just like David. When David defeated Goliath, all Israel got the victory. Well, guess what? Jesus defeated the devil and God's people got the victory. It's yours. It's your inheritance. It's been deposited in your account. It is legally and rightfully yours. It's why the Bible calls you more than a conqueror. How many of you know conquerors fight and win, but you didn't have to fight and you still won. You're more than a conqueror. Today receive your victory. 
I said receive your victory. Receive your victory over condemnation, guilt, and shame. Receive your victory over fear and intimidation. Receive your victory over poverty and lack. Receive your victory over every form of instability in your life, over depression and anxiety. Why? Because the victory is yours. The battle over darkness has been won. The serpent has been crushed. The father of lies has been exposed. The condemner has been condemned. And shame has been put to shame because he through death defeated him who had power over death, even the devil. And for this purpose was the Son of God manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. He, listen to me, he disarmed principalities and powers and made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. The greatest victory of all does not require you to fight. If there's any darkness in your life at all, receive the light that pierced through the darkness 2,000 years ago. Receive the light that the darkness cannot overcome. Receive the light of life. Receive the light of the world. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. A great light has flashed upon us. We've been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty, God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Hallelujah.